Hello. Ah, there you are. You want to hook? You want to hook up your talk to? Sure. Uh, to, to, okay. I was sure. nervous about Saturday, uh, Dan, but it's it's not looking bad. Oh, nervous! In what reason? Well, you know, we were running on weekdays, and when I was moving it to a Saturday, uh, I was concerned because uh, for those uh, who have little children, uh, yes. you are one of them. We yes. all know that it's not. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were wor you were worried about my physical and uh, well-being with my wife in the background <laughs> wanting to shoot me. <laughs> I, I'm I'm scared of her. I, I, <laughs> I see Gavinu. Hello, Gavinu. Hi, Dan. Nice to see you after all these years. Yeah, I know. So we haven't seen each other for a long time. A long time. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, yeah, sir, no problem. I didn't realize, actually, when you had invited me that it was a Saturday morning. Uh, hello, Sharam. <laughs> uh, I uh, tricked you. And Hi. You tricked me. Hi, Sharam. Hi. Uh, and, and yes. Okay, so let me see. I'll share my screen. It should work. Yeah, I've recently gone over to Zoom. We started class last, last week, so I've been uh, I see. using Zoom. I see. Yeah, we. Uh, that's what I did in spring. Uh, hopefully, same is happening now. I'm, I'm not teaching this term, so I don't, I'm, I'm ignoring all the, all the things that are going on. Lucky, lucky you. <laughs> okay, so, so now... The, let's see, I'm going to, I got to minimize this thing so I can see what's going on. And then I'm going to try to use the, the laser pointer. Oh, oh that's, cool. Doesn't work. Is that, can you see that? I can see. It's on the eraser. Yeah. It kind of, yeah, problem is working. it, nope, snap. The problem is it, well, that may not be terrible. The problem is if I use that, it, it, uh, it goes away and it puts a bar above my screen, which I don't know how to get rid oh. of But Anyway, I'll, I may just use the mouse. The mouse seems fine. Yeah, the mouse, the mouse might be safest, yes. Okay. okay, so how are we doing? Oh, we have a couple of minutes, uh, two minutes maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I'm seeing Dan after many years, actually. Last time I saw you was when you were about to join Georgia Tech. So that was a while ago. That's right. Yeah, yeah that, that was in 2007, which is hard for me to believe at this point. <laughs> 2013 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Almost 14. So by the way, is the sound OK? Is it too noisy? Is it too quiet? Is it? Uh... The sound is good. At least it is good okay, for me. Good. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I'm going to turn on the Facebook Live as well. Okay. <clears throat> Just need to take a look there. So that way it gets taped on, doubly taped on Facebook. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't. Uh, oh, I see. I don't. I don't know how to, you know, do such things. Uh, I, I'll make it public, so you can just. Uh... Okay. Takes a minute to prepare the live stream. So I'm doing it now. I did it once before, uh, and it worked out. So yeah, it, uh, it asks a lot of questions. Okay. Well. I said, Dan, make sure you don't say anything that can be construed as a, <laughs> a conspiracy theory. Yeah, right. Okay. Where, where we go, I won't put any cues on my uh, head. <laughs> That's right. Which, exactly. if, it weren't so, if it weren't so scary, it would be funny. <laughs> uh, okay, let me go ahead and introduce you. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, it is a... It is an absolute delight, first of all, that so many of you have, have joined us on a Saturday morning. I know that uh, Saturday morning may be a time when you may not want to uh, hear about much physics, uh, may, may want to catch up on sleep. So your presence is deeply appreciated. Uh, we have a 
very uh, interesting uh, speaker today. And many of you know uh, Dan Goldman. Uh, Dan comes from Georgia Tech. Uh, he's a Dunn family professor uh, in the School of Physics at Georgia Tech. And the title of his talk is Robophysics, uh, Robotics Meets Physics. I won't uh, read the abstract uh, and take up his time. Let me tell you a few words about Dan in case you, you, you don't, uh, you're not familiar with him. So Dan is, uh, as I said, a Dunn family professor in the School of Physics at Georgia Tech and the Georgia Power Professor of Excellence. Uh, professor Goldman became a faculty member uh, at Tech in 2007. Uh, he's an adjunct member of the School of Biology and is a member of the Interdisciplinary Bioengineering Graduate Program. Professor Goldman's uh, research program broadly investigates the interaction of biological and physical systems with complex materials like granular media. In particular, he integrates laboratory experiment, computer simulation, and physical and mathematical models to discover principles of movement of a diversity of animals and robots in controlled laboratory substrates. He received his BS from MIT in 1994 and his PhD uh, from Texas Austin with Harry Swinney in 2002. Um, he, he did postdoctoral work at UC Berkeley Department of Integrative Biology from 2003 to 2007 uh, and uh, studied locomotion biomechanics and then moved to uh, Georgia Tech. Dan was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2014. He received an NSF Career PKs Award uh, a DARPA Young Faculty Award, a Burroughs Welcome uh, Fund Career Award uh, at the Science Interface, and also a UT Austin Outstanding uh, Dissertation uh, in Physics Award in 2002-2003. So I won't take up any more of, of your time, Dan. And let's get rolling. Okay. Well, thank you. And I'm assuming you can all still hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So hello out there. Uh, I am Dan Goldman. Thank you, Sergeant, for the introduction and for the uh, invitation. It's an honor to present to you today. Uh, and I apologize if you're uh, suffering on a Saturday, uh, which I hope that I'll at least be able to entertain you a little bit. Okay. So the title of my talk is Robophysics, Robotics Meets Physics. Um, and it's sort of a discipline I'd say I've been working in or on or maybe invented about uh, about five, 10 years ago. Uh, and it really is uh, uh, been a lot of fun. And you might also see on the left this picture from the, uh, the play, the Czech play, Rossum's Universal Robotics, uh, uh, which was in 1920, from which the word robot uh, comes, which was forced to sort of translates from Czech to mean forced labor. Um, and so I'll apologize to my students if they feel a little bit sometimes like these robata in this picture. Uh, and on the right is sort of how a physicist views robots. Here's a sand swimming robot, which I'll uh, talk about and get into as we move along. Okay, and these are the folks who funded most of the work. Okay, so you probably have seen in the news that uh, robots are all around us. And if they're not all around us, they're coming to be all around us. They solve a lot of our problems. They build our cars. They uh, can even walk like bipeds. They can beat us in some of our uh, most complicated games. Uh, one day, maybe soon, uh, they will be driving us around and even bringing us our packages. So problems are all solved. This has been the domain of computer scientists and engineers for years and years and years. No need for physicists or robophysics. But I want to point out that actually these, these advances are restricted to, I'd say, relatively pristine environments. And the example I like to use is in summer 2018, you might remember that, that some boys, a soccer team, I believe, were, uh, were lost in a cave in Thailand. Um, and it took many days, many weeks, I guess, to, to ultimately extract them. And the extraction was done purely by human, if not forced, human labor. Uh, and you might say, where were the robots? Where was a robot that could enter the cave here and make its way through this torturous path through lots of different environments and ultimately find the kids and maybe even bring them food or water or even alert uh, others to their presence? And the answer is there were none and there continue to be no robots that can perform the kind of amazing tasks I showed on the previous slide in 
real world environments like caves, uh, in particular, locomotion through these complex environments. Um, this is somewhat surprising and still remains a little bit surprising to me. Uh, now, my background and my program at Georgia Tech is largely built on trying to understand movement. So these problems are near and dear to my heart and movement of biological systems. Uh, and of course, movement is a fundamental behavior in living systems across scales from an elephant to a uh, crawling cell to you know, flying uh, insect uh, to a swimming uh, lamprey or eel. Organisms excel at moving through complicated, stochastic, non-linearly interacting environments uh, and do so with an efficacy that challenges our best uh, robots. Now, when I first got into this business of movement, I, like most physicists, I would imagine, thought what could be, sorry, there's something got me hurt. Because movement was what I had learned about uh, starting from introductory physics. Uh, and movement was basically solved by Galileo and then Newton. Oops. Sorry, my internet connection is unstable. Is everybody still hearing me? Surgeon, still hearing me okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. We are, we are okay. Okay, okay, um, sorry. I just got to. There's a... some background noise. I, I can't figure out where it's from, but it's okay. For now. Yeah, let me, let me do this then. I tried to go to a quietest spot in my. Let me, I'm just going to walk into a quieter spot. Okay. It's hard to find okay. quiet spots. I'm locked down at home. <laughs> uh, hang on, let's see if I can, sorry, if I can find an even quieter spot. No, 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 no. I apologize. Hang on. Hang on. Giving talks during the pandemic while locked, while quarantined is, I find, yeah. Yeah, that's, a little yes. tricky. It is tricky. But okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Better, I think right? this should be a quieter. Okay, this is better. Good. Yeah, I think good, good, so. good. Okay, okay, this should be better. I hope. Okay, so uh, is this a little better, a little quieter? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay, but, well, we'll go with this spot. Okay. And if and if a, and if a seven year old comes in and starts to yell and scream, well, oh, we wake we, people up. We would okay. welcome. We would welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, movement is something that I've you know that we in physics uh, think about and study from day one, basically, right? And we but we tend to think of it in the way that uh, our forebears thought of it. That's Pick Galileo. Um, and the reason I picked this and called it De Motu is because after he died, he wrote a book called De Motu Antiquaria, or the book was published after he died, De Motu Antiquaria. And movement here, and what I thought was interesting in movement, again, when I first started learning physics, is movement is largely a consequence of either doing nothing, inertia keeps you going in the absence of external forces, or motion due to external forces, you know, of course, cause accelerations like gravity. And uh, this is what makes planets uh, orbit stars, et cetera, et cetera. And these, and so I would have thought movement was sort of solved. Well, it turns out there was another person who's well known to folks in biomechanics, but maybe not so well known to folks in physics. And this was a contemporary of Galileo, a guy named Borelli. And Borelli wrote the book, De Motu Animalium, echoing Aristotle. And here he was interested in a different kind of movement. This is the kind of movement which derives from internal forces creating shape changes in an organism and interacting via an environment and ultimately producing uh, translation or rotation. Um, and of course, in an organism, it's contracting muscles which generate forces. Um, and I'm going to call this self-propulsion to distinguish it from the kind of movement which we know and love from our early days in physics. And in fact, the interesting thing is, and I think that I'm preaching to the choir here, these problems are much more complicated than these kind of problems. And in fact, I think these are sort of required 21st century uh, scientific investigation uh, relative to what we've understood and, and learned from these kind of problems. Okay. Well, why, what do I mean? Well, self-propulsion in living systems emerges from myriad interacting elements and systems. So here is an example I like. It's a little frog, uh, which was studied by a former postdoc in my group when he was a PhD student. Uh, you might ask, how hard is it to understand uh, how far a frog jumps? Of course, then the question becomes, what do you mean by understanding? 
certainly if I know the forces here and I know the mass of this thing, I can, the force it generates on the ground. The mass I know, I can predict the acceleration. But suppose I want to go deeper. Suppose I want to understand how all the parts that make up this frog, which we actually know pretty well, the biophysics of most of many of these parts uh, and some of the neurobiology of this, can we somehow integrate all of this to make a model to predict how far a frog will jump? And so the question is, again, can we predict such a simple movement from such a reduction? And a kind of meta question, which emerges actually and is emerging more throughout my work, is how well do these parks have to work together for useful movement to emerge? And I'll maybe touch on that at the very, very end of the talk. Uh, and again, you might say, well, is this a real problem here? You know, it, it, certainly these are complicated nonlinear systems, but if we know all the parts, we ought to be able to, in some sense, make a model, put them together and, and, and predict something. Well, the nice thing is that robotics uh, and, and the millions of dollars that have been spent on robotics in natural environments provides a nice refutation of this reductionist paradigm. And I like to use this video. This is from about five years ago. And it was a challenge that was set up by the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, to basically take the best humanoid type robots in the world uh, and bring them together and try to have them compete to, uh, to perform a task. In this case, uh, let's say, move in a, in a human uh, friendly environment. So here you could see basically a blooper reel of the performance of these robots. Uh, and it's quite hysterical to watch. Although I would tell you that the that the uh, that the success reel is actually pretty hysterical too, because these robots move very slowly, and and the tasks are are completed, and if they are completed at all, in long times, uh, and with nothing of the efficacy and the and the grace of of living systems. And the interesting thing here, right, is that these robots are made and were made by the best engineers in the world. And so they know the, all the parts in these robots. They understand everything about the elements. The question is, how do you integrate to put together? Now, you might say, well, this is not fair. And you, you see videos on YouTube of robots running around and dancing around and, and looking much better than this. I will say buyer beware on those. Uh, let me give you examples that I know better. These are robots which in principle are much simpler. They don't have to worry about balancing. They're basically constrained to the ground. These are limbless snake-like robots. And in this case, these robots are actually very simple. You have about 16 motors which are connected serially and can be programmed to execute various uh, oscillatory patterns, um, generating waves and different shapes. And you'll notice that this snake-like robot, which it's supposed to be a snake-like robot, it's from how he chose its group at Carnegie Mellon, has trouble doing very snake-like things, which are, in this case, moving through an array of grass. Now, you might also say, well, that's not fair. That's a lot of degrees of freedom. How on earth should I think about coordinating these? Well, then you can go to something which has fewer degrees of freedom and is also close to the ground. Let's say a legged robot with six legs, which basically is spinning its legs in tripods, so it's basically a pretty simply controlled thing. And these kind of robots have terrible times interacting with complex terrain, uh, light sand and soil. Um, and I might even note that often we don't even know the interaction in, <laughs> interaction physics uh, governing, uh, for example, the, the, the movement of a limb against the ground. So this sort of says that even if you know all the parts, and of course, this is not a surprise to this audience, it is a challenge to predict the actually emergent features of these systems. And locomotion, I'm claiming, is an emergent feature. And of course, if we have such uh, capabilities, we'd be able to you know, do things more with better efficacy, including search and rescue, exploration, uh, and, and various other tasks. OK. So I've been thinking, as I was working with engineers who were making robots, that there really needed to be a physics of robotics and really, what I say is that studying the emergent aspects of real robots, and I'll call real robots those which actually have to go into complex natural environments and hardened and built to, built to you know, take it. Uh, An animal locomotion has been and remains a challenge. I don't know if you could see these videos very well, but on the top right is that snake robot that I showed. And on the bottom right is a video of a snake uh, gliding gracefully through grass and terrain uh, looking almost effortless as it goes. And the interesting thing is the following. 
it's been hard, I'd say, for physicists to get into the game of, orga, of robotics and, and organismal biomechanics because a few things. Robots have been expensive, hard to make flexible, hard to add sensors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Animals are often uncooperative. For anyone who studies biomechanics, the getting an animal to do what you want it to do repeatedly is a uh, major part of the art. And they're often too good. This organism, it doesn't look like there's a problem here. It kind of looks like a non-problem. How hard could it be to wiggle your body and move through the environment? Because the organism does it so gracefully. And we have limited capabilities to record muscle and neural activity, 3D kinematics and dynamics in natural environments. However, in the last 10 years, I would say, at least for me, it's been a wonderful revolution in how I've uh, been able to think about and address these problems because there has been uh, enormous advances in low cost, but very powerful and smart motors, controllers, and sensors. Now, basically a click away on Amazon. And with the advent of 3D printing, one can start to make various interesting types of devices, self-propelling devices, and, and start to play and test. So it's increasingly easy to make low cost, what I'll call robo-physical models, to test and generate control hypotheses, compare experiment to theory and vary parameters to discover new dynamics. Here's a review article we wrote a few years back. I should say that this robot was made by a postdoc in my group who was a biologist by training in PhD and decided to come to my group to basically learn how to do this kind of stuff and uh, was able to make this sand swimming robot and we were able to discover some interesting things about how it, how it moves in granular materials. Okay, and of course, then I like to put this up. Uh, I sort of bastardize Feynman's quote: "What I cannot create, I do not understand." And I really think, when studying living systems, that there's a really a strong the synthesis aspects of of these studies are are very important. Okay, so then here it is: the goal of locomotion robophysics would be the systematic discovery and search for principles of successful and failed movement of self-propelling systems interacting with natural environments. So the engineers who I interact with like to show demo reels of videos of their robots successfully moving in complex environments, and they tend to focus on those. But it turns out that from a physicist's point of view, often the failures are as interesting and as instructive as the uh, successes. In fact, one of the most interesting things I think here is that we have really very little understanding often of if a robot is programmed to do a certain task, why it succeeds or fails. Uh, and in fact, given that when I started this, active matter wasn't really something, and now it's huge, I would really almost say that kind of robophysics is actually putting the active into active matter. Instead of assuming an object or a self-propeller can go from A to B, we're actually trying to understand how it can go from A to B. Okay, so in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, Robots, robophysical experimental devices have exploded in my lab. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you about all of them today. Uh, in fact, I'm going to tell you about very few of them today, but you're welcome to go to our website and take a look. Uh, but they range from robots, which are sort of have a practical bent of, of trying to understand how to move on granular regolith in, in extraterrestrial environments recreated in the laboratory to kind of weirdo situations where we, we take uh, ensemble of robots that collectively are immobile but can collectively propel uh, and sort of everywhere in between. And I'm not gonna of course tell you about all these but it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, today's talk is gonna focus on one particular, <clears throat> one particular story which I think uh, it really encapsulates this kind of interaction of robotics and physics and, and to some extent biology. Uh, and again, here's a few reviews, re recent reviews. Um, and I'm going to basically talk about a geometric mechanics framework for locomotion coordination and control in highly damped environments. And that sounds very specific, but I want to show you that in fact is a pretty general uh, story that I'm going to tell. These are the folks who've done the bulk of the work. Um, and I'll try to highlight them as I, as I move along. Okay, so the terrestrial world, of which I'm particularly focused on, is often frictional and deformable. And what I mean by deformable is, well, if I sort of are, am tromping through leaf litter or the desert or snow, the material can yield and flow uh, upon sufficient forcing. And frictional, well, it turns out that, that it's really uh, frictional type interactions, Coulomb frictional type interactions, which ultimately dominate the kind of dynamics that we see. 
In particular, uh, dry sand, granular material, we found is a good modelable, model flowable frictional terrain. And here's a video of a, one of the denizens of a uh, granular environment as it's trying to chase another denizen of a granular environment. Okay, one 30 seconds of granular materials that's relevant here. Uh, if I take a plate and I poke it into the sand and I drag it to the right and measure the reaction force, I will note that above, uh, below, here's displacement and, and the force and why I didn't label it, and the reaction force. Uh, below a certain characteristic displacement, the material remains solid-like until the force uh, exceeds a, a yielding force uh, in which the material begins to flow like a fluid. And in fact, in this regime, when displacements are small enough and, and forces remain below yield forces, we call these sort of solid-like granular materials. And above this, the flow like a fluid, as you can sort of see from the video here. And we tend to call these frictional fluids for reasons I'll come back to. Uh, these forces are largely rate independent. So whether I move an object through a granular material, a little immersed object or granular material a millimeter a second or 10 centimeters a second, Unlike a viscous fluid, the forces are basically the same, and forces tend to increase with depth and compaction. These are not so important for this talk. Okay, well, robot snakes tend to be stymied by sand. There's just an example. Here is that same robot that I showed you earlier having such trouble in, in, uh, in, in grass. Turns out that my colleague was interested in bringing these robots to the desert to try to search for artifacts in Egypt uh, and when he got to the desert <clears throat> and to the caves he wanted to explore, discovered a problem that this robot, which moved so effectively over hard ground using the so-called sidewinding gate, had a whole lot of trouble moving up sandy slopes and, in fact, ultimately thwarted their investigations. We sort of understood and studied this problem in 2014 and learned some of the tricks that the real sidewinding snakes use to actually uh, control yield stresses in these granular materials. Okay, so that becomes the big question, how to control movement in substrate that behave like a solid or a fluid? Well, I'm gonna give you the punchline. It turns out that often organisms use the fluid-like aspects and these organisms, which I've, a number of which we've studied in some detail, are, uh, give us various clues about how that happens. In particular, I wanna tell you about this little lizard called the sandfish lizard, which has sort of opened up a lot of our understanding of uh, more diverse organisms as well as robots. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this video playing, but what you're supposed to be seeing is basically a blur. This is the sandfish lizard moving across the surface of sand. Uh, and if I slow the video down, so you can actually see something about 50 times, you'll notice that the animal moves across the material, basically using a lizard-like uh, walking gait. And when it reaches, a certain point, it decides to poke its head into the ground and uses body and limbs in concert uh, to propel itself into the granular material. So basically disappearing in the blink of an eye, okay? If you use an X-ray machine, basically a high-speed X-ray imager to see what's going on underneath the granular material, uh, you basically see something like this. And I don't know if anyone can see that playing, but what you should be seeing is sort of a little white wiggling undulator <clears throat> as it moves from left to right across the screen. And this is the first, these were the first x-ray images of this little lizard swimming in sand. Okay, you could get more of an idea of what's going on if you, if you uh, add little markers, little lead markers to the skin of the animal, uh, bond them with super glue. And then you can actually see as the animal moves through the environment, that uh, it's basically using a wave of body bending propagating from head to tail, uh, along with uh, limbs that are basically held folded to the side. Uh, so it's really the body wave which is generating the thrust to move this animal, okay? So how do we understand how fast this animal moves underneath the sand as a function of various parameters, like how the amplitude of the wave on the body, the speed of the wave, et cetera, et cetera. Well, our approach is the following. We basically, we don't go to the desert. 
We basically bring the desert environment to us. We use tools like air fluidized beds to control the compaction of a granular material and the initial state. So we flow air up through a porous plate, uh, through a collection of grains, turn off the airflow, it settles into a loosely packed pristine state of which we can then run experiments. We of course study <clears throat> and image the organism tracking the motion of either markers or, or the shape of the organism as a function of time. And just to give you a little bit of data here, this is what it looks like. Uh, the midline of the organism uh, is in X and Y space. The color indicates the time. And you'll notice that when the animal's on the surface, it basically walks with a straight back. And then when it begins to bury, it begins this sort of undulatory pattern. If I pull out one of these little snapshots, you see that subsurface, basically, this is the shape of the organism. It looks essentially like a single period sinusoidal traveling wave with a characteristic amplitude and wavelength. And the interesting thing is over a wide range of conditions of the material, whether it be large particles, small particles, and compact material, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the depth to which the organism uh, intrudes, moves into the material, it always keeps this kind of amplitude to wavelength ratio about 0.2. So that's kind of interesting, why that number? Uh, well, one way to get at why that number, um, <clears throat> before we had what I'm gonna tell you what we have, was to actually do full uh, discrete element method simulation. So here is a 300,000 particle simulation and the particles above this virtual sandfish lizard uh, are, are clear so that you can see things. Uh, the virtual sandfish lizard is basically, again, like those robots, serially connected motors. In this case, there's so many you can't see them. And we play in those serially connected motors a pattern, uh, a, a pattern which, which generates a wave of body curvature which propagates head to tail. The interesting thing about this movie is that if we've colored the particles by their granular temperature, so the redder they are, the faster they're moving. And so you'll note that in this simulation, the little swimmer is basically only has a local granular fluid near where it's wiggling. Everywhere else, the material is basically frozen. More interestingly, <clears throat> this is relevant for the, the biggest idea in the talk, is that if I turn off those motors in that simulation, essentially instantaneously, that lizard simulation comes to rest. It stops moving. It stops self-propelling. If I stop the self-deformation, I stop instantly the self-propulsion. Not like an eel, by the way, swimming in a fluid. Now, Doc, when we started this, we had little understanding of the kind of forces that an that, uh, organism like this would experience. So we basically spent a lot of time doing soft matter, what's called soft matter physics, I guess now, and that's uh, intruding objects into uh, granular material, like little cylinders, and measuring forces as a function of the orientation of the object to try to build up a database for forces on the thing. And these kind of go in a virtuous cycle. And I'll give you one big result from this program. And it's basically uh, a tool that, and a gift that has just kept giving um, <clears throat> for the last many years. Uh, and it's a way to actually calculate, putting together the insights I, I just mentioned, how fast an organism propels in an environment. And the, 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 this idea was basically created in, in the 30s through 50s. It's called resistive force theory. And my student, Yang Ding, who's now in Beijing, uh, was the one who, who basically just guessed this, this would work in, in granular systems. And the idea is very simple, is that if in the upper left, if I have an organism represented by a mathematical line uh, and, and generated, made of uh, lots of infinitesimal cell segments, which are instantaneously translating through the environment uh, along some rule, um, basically, I can decompose that organism into these elements and I can compute forces on the elements. Uh, those forces, and I'll amplify a little bit more, a little bit, basically can be decomposed into thrust and drag forces. And I can essentially sum the, the, the thrust minus drag over the body, integrate, set that equal to zero. That's the first big onsets that, that basically there's no inertia in the system. So I'll just set this net force on the object equal to zero. Uh, and then I can input a particular traveling wave and extract the forward velocity of that wave of that body, which ensures force balance. Okay. 
that's the that's the that's the big game here in resistive force theory. Of course, this was created for movements in movement in low Reynolds number of fluids uh, initially <clears throat> um, uh, because it was hard to solve. Uh, you know, uh, use computers are impossible to use computers to calculate such things. Well, the interesting thing is that it works quite well in granular materials. So here I've plotted the displacement of the organism as a function of the amplitude over wavelength of the of the sinusoidal wave, which I indicated earlier. And the theoretical plot is, the theoretical prediction is in blue. So the displacement increases with increasing amplitude and wavelength divided by wavelength up to a certain point at which it starts to drop. The green is how much energy the uh, simulation uses, the theory uses to go a meter. Let's ignore that for now. But it predicts that there's a peak displacement that the organism will undergo in terms of its body lengths per undulation cycle. And lo and behold, the organism sits basically, uses that range of amplitude to wavelength, which are close to the maximum in that curve. Okay, that's it. A little more physical, um, <clears throat> I should say that the analysis, if you're interested, you can read the papers, is that, that it's basically a competition between increasing thrust and decreasing progress in the world frame. And you can see that more clearly in a little virtual sandfish race, if I have a low amplitude to wavelength ratio, I'm not generating much thrust per undulation cycle. If I have a high amplitude to wavelength ratio, I'm generating a lot of thrust because I have segments which are basically pushing backwards, uh, but I'm basically moving up and down uh, in, 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 a, in a line here. Whereas this magic amplitude to wavelength ratio of 0.2 essentially uh, is kind of a competition between those effects and moves the fastest. Okay. And in fact, in the world of what we call neural mechanics, which is biomechanics meets neural control, uh, and increasingly in robotics, we call this, that this is a goal that the organism is trying to achieve in its self-deformation pattern. We call these things templates. So this is a template, which is a organism is trying to achieve a wave of propagation of body bending from head to tail, and it is optimizing or targeting a particular set of parameters in that wave template to move effectively. Okay, this, uh, this thing will come up. Okay, well, that's fine. That's the theory versus the animal. What about uh, in a more real world environment? Well, in 2010 and 2011, we made uh, the first sand swimming robot. And in fact, it was uh, recognized as something interesting, I guess, because we won the best paper award at a robotics meeting. And here you can see the robot. Well, you can't see the robot, but here it has two masts on it. Uh, and it's swimming through a granular material of six millimeter plastic spheres. Uh, and it's made of these same servo motors that I mentioned uh, before. And it has a little skin on it so that they don't get uh, damaged or interfered with. Well, it turns out that <clears throat> you can look at this robot or robophysical device, and here's the x-ray image that I showed in the first slide of the robot moving underneath the granular material, and here's a discrete element method simulation of the same, and you can see the displacement as a function of amplitude over wavelength goes up and comes down, and again, it turns out that that parameter 0.2 is basically the parameter which maximizes its displacement. Okay. Now, Turns out that, I'll just make a plug, that this idea, this frictional fluid picture captures mechanics in diverse granular locomotors. Whether it be this little lizard swimming in sand or this robot swimming in sand, or a sidewinder or a sidewinder robot, or a mudskipper fish or a mudskipper robot, this idea of using granular resistive force theory uh, in this frictional fluid regime uh, where essentially forces are given by resistive force relations, which I haven't told you about yet, and where inertia is not really important, dissipation dominates, continues to give us uh, happy results and the ability to predict and, and model uh, the locomotion performance of a diverse collection of organs. Okay, and it turns out also that, that these resistive force theory, the basic force relations that go into resistive force theory have now been rationalized and explained by Ken Cameron and his folk group at MIT. It turns out they're an unknown consequence of frictional plasticity. So the kind of physics that is 
underlying the interaction of these organisms as they're moving or swimming is basically can be approximated by a drucker prager type plasticity model. And you can look at his papers if you're interested. Now, okay, fine. That's sort of the biomechanics analysis, which we've been doing for years. Uh, and, and it allows us to simulate and model, uh, but doesn't particularly unify uh, in the way I'm gonna tell you next. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the kind of clue. If I look at undulatory propulsion in this sand swimming lizard and these other organisms I just talked about, they have a very interesting feature. And that feature is what I alluded to, is that these are not, these organisms are not swimming like eels. So this eel in the bottom left, I hope you could see it, it's gliding gracefully through a fluid, generating waves of body curvature from head to tail. If this organism stops self uh, deforming, stops generating waves, it'll stop self, it will not stop self propelling. It will continue to glide through the water. In contrast, if this organism stops self uh, deforming, stops wiggling its body, it will instantaneously stop, close to instantaneous stop. So this organism is not swimming like an eel through sand. In fact, it's much more swimming like a nematode, a C. elegans worm, through uh, fluid, or a spermatozoa uh, through a fluid. And the analogy here is that here in this organism, inertia is much less than frictional fluid forces, whereas here, inertia is much less than viscous forces. And you might think, well, this is a cute analogy, but it turns out that this, this sets and constrains much of the dynamics and, and how organisms coordinate their body parts to move effectively in diverse terrestrial environments, which I mentioned before, are highly damped. And we're finding this as a principle. So basically, when you're looking at a sandfish swimming in sand, you're essentially seeing a sea elegans mimic, just at a much, much larger scale. Okay, so that actually is an interesting clue, because that led us into, well, before I say what that led us into, let me just give you one little sense. Here would be a nematode worm swimming through a fluid, and here's a sandfish lizard swimming through granular material, and here's resistive force theory calculations of those situations. And you'll note that the, nema, the sandfish lizard looks like it advances more per undulation cycle than the nematode worm. The nematode worm looks like it's thrashing about. That's just because it's not advancing very much per undulation cycle. You can sort of see that in the calculation for the resistive force theory. And that all has to do with actually the resistive forces that these organisms experience. In the low Reynolds number situation, when viscosity dom dominates inertia, this little nematode or spermatozoa is essentially to some approximation feeling forces on its infinitesimal elements, which are basically stoked. Uh, you are breaking up, I think, cylinders, to some approximation. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah, you broke up a little bit. It's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just, I just got a, a note that my internet was unstable. Uh, is this better? Can you hear me now? I'm just assuming that I can be tired still. Okay. Uh, the perpendicular forces, if I drag an object through a granular material, are basically described by uh, signs uh, times some numbers and the per parallel forces times cosines. And in a viscous fluid, we basically have uh, a so-called drag anisotropy of about two to one. And in a granular frictional fluid, that drag anisotropy is larger and that rationalizes why an organism swimming in sand can advance basically twice as far per undulation cycle as a low Reynolds number swimmer. That's a technical point for the experts, but I just wanted to make it. Uh, because it turns out that what this says is that you can put kind of these granular systems and low Reynolds number systems on in some way equal footing. And that equal footing is that everything is dominated by the sequence of shapes that the organism undergoes during its undulation. Well, it turns out, and most people know this, uh, in physics know this talk, and Purcell gave a beautiful talk and then <clears throat> turned into um, a, uh, of course, a, an article on motion and life at low Reynolds number. 
And one of the important things he noted in this is that when Reynolds numbers are small and you can't coast, again, everything is dominated by a sequence of shapes and time drops out the window. This explains why the so-called scallop theorem, which says that if I make a reversible cycle at low Reynolds number, I don't get anywhere, exists. And Purcell introduced something called, we call now the Purcell three link swimmer, uh, which is basically a link, a link, and a link, and those links, those arms, and two motors, uh, which can be controlled uh, to move as a function of time, although again, time doesn't matter, uh, with angles theta one and theta two. And so a particular swim gate might be to first move this arm and then move this arm upward and, and make a wave of propagation of angle over, over the body. And this is hard to say, in fact, I probably just screwed it up. So it's easier to talk about in a configuration space. If I plot theta one and theta two, a path in this configuration space is basically a wave which propagates head to tail on this thing. Okay, well, again, as I've told you, what we found is that our, our animals and robots are essentially mimics of this situation, uh, this highly damp situation, uh, and I'm told by this gentleman who I met when he visited Georgia Tech that his advisor, uh, Frank Wilczek, was in the audience for Purcell's original talk and heard the talk and realized that basically, and he told him this, uh, Shapir says he basically said this sentence nearly, we could formulate the problem of self-propulsion at low Reynolds number in terms of a gauge field over the space of shapes. And my understanding of this and talking to folks who were uh, around at the time, this was in the 80s, uh, is that basically this went over like a lead balloon in physics because it seemed, why do I need something like gauge fields or gauge theory, you know, elements from particle physics uh, to understand the movement of a little swimmer at low Reynolds number. And it turned out, I think it was largely forgotten by the physics community, but not by engineers. And the engineers in particular were folks who descended from Marsden's group and were associated with Marsden's group at Caltech in the 80s and 90s, and basically used these ideas uh, to create a, a framework to control robots under the name of geometric control, largely. And these two guys, who I collaborated with, uh, actually provided the great advance in which you could go from infinitesimal swimming motions of spheres and circular swimmers to use this geometric framework for swimming uh, with large self-deformations. Okay, now let me just walk you through that. Uh, Dan, Dan, just one quick question. If you're on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um... I agree. It makes sense that in both cases, the Stokes fluid and the granular medium under these conditions, uh, you can forget about inertia. But given yeah. that the damping mechanisms in the two cases are different, are there important differences in the characteristics of swimming? Or is it practically as though you could just carry one over to the other? You know, to a good approximation, you can practically carry one over the other. And well, what I meant by showing this, basically this plot was that you know, I didn't show you much evidence of this, but basically the thing which carries it from one to the other is essentially the difference in the, in the drag forces on elements. In, in low Reynolds right. number, it's basically Stokes flow and granular. Now, does this work everywhere? I don't know, but we're finding that th this, this scheme, you know, because what it relies on is that, that also there's no hysteresis in the, in, in the material, right? So that there's no memory. And that turns out to be a good approximation in many situations, bad in others. And we could talk about that, where that's good and bad. Um, in fact, we just had a paper in, in eLife, which investigates these kind of memory effects in these things. But when there's no memory, and basically you have a kind of reversibility, which I'll get into in a minute, the frictional fluid is kind of a viscous fluid with a key distinction, which I'm kind of not talking about here, is that speed is, does not matter in, in the frictional fluid. These are rate independent. Whereas in, in, in Stokes, they're rate dependent. That adds some interesting bells and whistles, but nothing, nothing fundamental, I would say. But, but you know, in, in the one case, you have long range flow fields and the other you, yes. have, you don't. So there must be situations okay. where that matters. 
Okay, well, here's what I'll say. Yes, in fact, the very amusing part of this is that everybody knows that resistive force theory is not a particularly good uh, calculation scheme for low Reynolds number swimmer, right? Uh, it turns out it's wonderful for the granular swimmers. And that's because now Cameron's showing that the equations of motion, which are largely governing the granular systems, are plasticity models, which are hyperbolic PDEs, which are highly local. So, and again, I just brushed through a lot of this. The key ingredient is that I can linearly superpose uh, in the resistive force theory, the elements and sum them up. Uh, and it turns out that approximation in, in Stokes fluids is not a good one when, 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 when elements get too close, but is a very good one, even when elements get pretty close in the granular systems. So you're exactly okay, right. I'm being, that's that's yeah. a really useful answer. Yeah, I'm being, I'm being a little bit uh, glib in that, uh, but mainly the, the, the point I want to make is that it's really kind of these dissipation dominated environment in these organisms, these terrestrial organisms, which dissipation is so huge that inertial effects are basically wiped out. Yeah. Okay. So I'll move along here. Um, and okay. So here's the story. Here's the kind of will check. Uh, and, and then, um, and Shapir, you know, filtered through the engineers and then into my colleagues, control theorists through the years. And it's a really simple, argument. <clears throat> it's basically that if I want to understand locomotion, it's connection of two spaces. Uh, I have one space, which is a shape manifold, a la Purcell, which is the space of internal degrees of freedom of the swimmer. And then the other manifold here is SE2, space of 2D rigid body kinematics. And let's just pick the, oops, let's just pick the, uh, the Purcell swimmer. So in the Purcell swimmer, again, I have two angles, which are basically I can trace through this configuration space. And in, in it's, I'm interested in knowing where uh, its uh, orientation and position will be after uh, some path in this space. And so locomotion then is how paths in the shape space generate paths in the real space. In this case, how changes in alpha one and alpha two lead to movement. And the game here, and again, here I have to find alpha one and alpha two, the key assumption that these guys make is that basically body velocities, how much I displace or rotate in the real world, are linearly related by some matrix, sort of an interesting matrix, three vector fields, uh, times the joint velocities. So if I make an infinitesimal little wiggle in my configuration space, the onsats, the guess is that I will be linearly related to that in my, in my real space. So I make a little wiggle in my body and I translate uh, proportional to that by this thing. And this thing is called the connection vector fields the gauge fields in the language of Wilczek and Shapir. And this is, has to be calculated from the physics of the medium. So whether you're in a granular material or low Reynolds number fluid, you calculate this thing, okay? Well, what does that get you? Well, I'm gonna skip over a lot of stuff. Uh, you calculate it. Basically what you do is you take every instantaneous shape, pose of the organism or robot or what have you, and you perturb around that shape and you track how far it will translate or rotate. And you do that for every shape. So you have to pre-compute this thing, this called connection field. Um, but it turns out, and then of course, displacement would be basically a, 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 an iterative line integral over these little infinitesimal displacements. Um, but that turns out to be a pain in the neck to do these line integrals because of the non-commutivity effects of translation or rotation. And again, I'm skipping and just blasting through this. We have papers on this. What you really want to do is you want to use Stokes theorem to turn a line integral into a surface integral. And it turns out that you can do that and you can generate this, this quantity on the right, which is the curl of A plus this Lie bracket. Uh, and the folks in this field call these things height functions. And so then your game is instead of a line integral to do a surface integral over this height function and a gate will be a closed path in this space, okay? And so visually what that says is that if I do a surface integral over a height function, and this is the contour map representation, and I'm sorry for the quality, but black and red are different signs in the, in the, uh, in the field, in this height function field. Basically, if I do a closed loop in this space, in this case, a circle, which is playing a sinusoidal wave on the front uh, arm and a 
cosine on the back arm to generate a wave. This says that if I do a surface integral over this, since it's enclosing a amount of sine area, then that will be my displacement, okay? Well, no one had ever tested this stuff. Uh, and one of the reasons no one ever tested it is because it was only useful, as far as I know, for infinitesimal uh, self-deformations. Because there's a problem, as you know, in SE2, that translations and rotations uh, don't commute. Uh, and so doing these calculations was hard. It turned out that this guy, when he was a PhD student who chose it, Ross Hatton, who's now at Oregon State, figured out the right gauge. He figured out an optimal frame to attach to the body to minimize non commutivity effects and essentially finding a good gauge which would, which would allow one to calculate for large amplitude self deformations. And again, skipping over a lot of details, uh, I just want to show you how this stuff works. So, okay, uh, and I'm going to run out of what do I have about 10 minutes now? About 10, 12 minutes, yeah. Okay, Oof, I'm going to run out of time. So I'm going to, I'm just going to give you uh, part of the story here that the interesting thing is that these height functions enable visualization of how self-deformation leads to net translation and rotation. So these are calculated height functions for granular material using the granular resistive force theory. And here I could show that basically in these, uh, there's three height functions, one for x, y, and theta. And this illustrates the principle here that if I do a closed loop in this, in this, in this configuration space where alpha one and alpha two are on the axes here, this closed loop, since it integrates over negative signed area here, will give me a positive amount of X translation over one cycle. Since it integrates over positive and negative regions in the Y direction, I will enclose net zero signed area after one cycle. And so I, after one cycle, I should not translate anywhere in Y. And in theta, a same story. I enclose positive and then negative. So I don't, I don't rotate. And in fact, that's what you see. This is a calculation. So instantaneously, the thing is undergoing all sorts of interesting wiggles. But after a cycle, it is basically oscillated into a, a, a displacement with no displacement in lateral or angular directions. Okay. The cool thing then is this, we tested this for the first time back seven years now. Uh, and we were able to show that essentially the, the, uh, the robot experiments um, map nicely onto the theory and the uh, discrete element method simulation. Here is the forward displacement height function. And now I'm comparing gates, which are uh, of uh, circles in this space. And it instantly, these diagrams instantly tell you something about how you should coordinate your body parts because they say, and, and what effect that has. If I start with a small circular gate in the middle of this configuration space, well, that will enclose a certain amount of area. If I double the radius of that, that is essentially increasing the amplitude of undulation of the, of the flapping arms. Then that says that if this, this sign and magnitude in the height function are, are basically constant, which they are in granular material near the origin, then basically the displacement should go quadratically in the, in the flapping angle. And indeed, that's what you see experimentally up to a certain point where basically your, your curve starts to eat into this area of opposite sign. And so your surface integral over one cycle should start to decrease. That's what the theory says. We weren't able to test it in the experiment up to that, up to that point, uh, but the discrete element method start to drop off. More interestingly, it says that if only I could trace a path in this space, which I, you see with my mouse, looks kind of like a butterfly, I'd be able to avoid regions of, of positive sign as I'm going clockwise around here and only enclose regions of negative. And it turns out that if you do this, you can come up with very crazy gates, which assuming you have no power limitations, basically optimize the amount of displacement that you undergo per cycle. And the cool thing is that I don't think without this scheme, this calculation scheme, we would have ever thought to try a gate like this. And it gets even more interesting because 
I can imagine that I want to make a robot turn in place, right? And so how do I make a robot turn in place? Well, in my theta height function, I create a path which goes clockwise in a region where there's negative area and counterclockwise in a region where there's positive. And if I do that, this sort of figure eight in the space, I will have rotated by a finite amount without translating because the symmetry of the X and the Y uh, lead to integrals which are zero without translating and, and pure rotation. So that's kind of cool. Um, and here's some experimental data, which is in accord with the theory. Quite good. Okay. And again, to back to Shuram's question, these height functions now help us compare movement in different environments. So I can look at the theta, x, y, and theta height functions in granular versus viscous, and you'll note that basically the symmetries uh, are, are in accord, uh, but um, the, the, the quantitative details matter, whether there's large regions uh, in the center and, and how they fall off, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let me get to sort of the punchline of this because people ask us, does this uh, apply to systems with more than two degrees of freedom? And here I have now, uh, because that's all fine and good for a robot that is in uh, you know, a three-link swimmer, but what about something that you want to make to actually move in a, mm. in a tie cave? Well, here's the trick. Here's a 16 degree of freedom robot. As I said, this geometric techniques, they're not limited to SE2 uh, or two dimensional configuration spaces, but they're most convenient in terms of a calculation tool and for humans to stare at when you can decompose a thing into, into two degrees of freedom. So basically we did that. Uh, we did dimensionality reduction. We'd say, well, we'll just approximate an arbitrary trapes curvature as a sum of two basis functions. So here's the curvature along a body, uh, which is going to be described by two basis functions. And we're going to start with sine and cosine bases, multiplying by different weights, such that if I were to cycle through these weights in this configuration space now defined by these bases, I can make a little swimmer, a continuous swimmer, Basically, I can approximate a multi-degree of freedom robot as a continuous swimmer uh, and, and then generate waves that propagate head to tail. And it turns out, long story short, that it works quite nicely. So here is the so-called the connection vector fields. Here are these height functions, again, looking like a blob of red in the center. And if I go clockwise, I think I changed my sign convention. If I go clockwise around this blob, mm. I will pick up displacement. And as I increase my radius of this circle, that means I'm increasing my amplitude uh, of my, of my um, gate. And you'll note that if I plot body lengths per cycle as a function now, no longer of this amplitude to wavelength parameter that I talked about early on, but a, a parameter which was related basically the curvature, the peak curvature of the robot. You see that the robot experiments are in blue and they peak at this value, which is essentially the amplitude of the wavelength of this sinusoidal curve, about 0.2. Uh, and the simulation, the RFT simulation, and the, uh, the surface integral, the geometric formulation, are in good accord. And then you can start to do fun things like compare across different environments. So for example, here's a height function for granular material, and here's a two to one viscous fluid. And you'll note that the, again, like I showed before, that the swimmer in the granule material moves basically twice as far per undulation cycle. And it turns out from the geometric point of view for the same circular gate in this configuration space, it's just because this height function is a redder red. And that's because the drag anisotropy in the granule material is greater. You could play more games. You could play games with the drag anisotropy uh, and varying that. And then you could start to sort of say, for a given drag anisotropies, what would be the best way to wiggle my body? In this case, it's actually prescribing an ellipse through this configuration space. And so these become the best way, assuming you're not power limited, to move a little wiggler, not only at a viscous fluid, but a viscous fluid where the drag anisotropy is 20 to one. This is for the experts here. Okay, now. It turns out that we can also use this to understand movement of organisms. Uh, and this is a paper which is in review. And basically, you can take these same organisms that I, this organism I talked about, this I haven't mentioned, which is another sand swimmer. 
and you can decompose their dynamics into two variables. You can pretend the animals are sums of sines and cosines, which can then create a circle in the configuration space. And you could use this machinery to compute these height functions. And lo and behold, when you do the surface integrals, basically you find that, like I showed you before, this sandfish lizard has this magic amplitude of wavelength ratio of 0.2, which again in this kappa lambda space maps to about six or seven, and that's where it sits. And another organism which uses a different combination of waves sits at a different peak curvature, uh, and that's where the surface integral says roughly it should be, within 10 or 20%. Okay, and it turns out this is the gift that keeps giving. Uh, so whether you're this snakes or these lizards swimming in sand or moving on sand, or a sidewinder rattlesnake moving over sand, or salamanders walking, or giant centipedes, uh, basically the, the principle becomes maximize your berries phase subject to constraint to discover the optimal parameters for how organisms should control for wave patterns that move from head to tail. And that's really my story. Um, there's a coda, which I just want to, if I have four minutes, uh, Surjit, can I take four minutes or three minutes? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. There's a coda because I want to say two things. One, okay, where's the robots in all this? Well, okay, uh, it turns out that I have a very creative and excellent postdoc who comes from an engineering background who got interested in this, working with a theoretician in my group who said, well, I wonder if I could make a robot that could basically go anywhere in the world using all this stuff. So we've been studying these giant centipedes, giant, they're, I don't know, 10, 20 centimeters long, uh, for a while with not much, uh, uh, to not much effect because they're so complicated in principle. They bend their body, they have lots of legs, but they're really good at moving everywhere in natural terrain if you've ever been to the desert to see these things. Well, a couple years back, a new advance came along and these are these neural nets for tracking. And now with a program called Deep Lab Cut in this case, we can actually train a neural net to track all the limbs of a centipede and the body bending segments of a centipede in the laboratory. With a lot of clicking and with an excellent undergrad who sits there and babysits the program, but this allows us to actually get the kind of tracking and kinematics we have for more simple organisms. Okay, turns out that we can dimensionality reduce this poor centipede again from 40 limbs, uh, 40 limbs and 20 segments to basically two waves, a wave which uh, travels down the body and waves of stepping, uh, wave of bending which travels down the body, and waves of stepping which travel down the legs, both waves that traveling head to tail. And then we can actually, in a different configuration space, this is now two phases, one representing a, a contact phase of the limbs, another a body undulation phase, it's not important. You can basically, that's how we represent this thing. And we do that because it turns out that the theoreticians have now shown us that the appropriate height functions, and I'm going really fast, are now on a torus in these uh, spaces. And here is a height function, so I'm not gonna tell you how to read, you have to read our papers. But basically you're supposed to be impressed that the animal is data is in purple dots here, and the theoretical optimum is in solid lines here, enclosing the maximal amount of red, going around a path which my mouse is sort of tracing. And what you're supposed to be impressed by is that the geometric theory says that displacement as a function of this relative phasing of limbs and body should be maximal above about pi. And that's where we sort of see an animal. This is all very preliminary stuff on the animal side of things. Okay, that's cool. And what it is very cool is that if you have a brilliant postdoc, she figures out how to make a robo-physical multi-segmented myriapod robot. And here's what it kind of looks like. Here's a segment which has a motor which can control limbs lifting up and down. They're always pi out of phase. Uh, it has a motor which can control the body segment. And if you string these things together, you can create a centipede robo-physical model which you can test the geometric predictions. So here it's moving. Here it's moving where I'm varying the leg phase shift relative to the body wave in two different amounts. Uh, and you can plot the displacement as a function of this leg phase shift. And you see that it's worst if I put them at a pi phase shift, 
and greatest if I put him closer to two pi, where the body segment bending is basically helping out the leg propulsion, okay? It turns out you can put these in more challenging situations and you can watch this robot fail, which again is interesting. And then you could go back to the biology and you can actually stare at these centipedes and say, well, how are they so effective? And there's a big idea that enters here. And the big idea is that we think that a lot of the control that these organisms are doing, in addition, so there's a natural coordination of body and limb segment dynamics, is actually built into the mechanism. So you'll note that these limbs, this is a glass sidewall that you're sort of seeing this animal through. These limbs are kind of folding up against the glass sidewall and folding up against impurities that we think passively as the organism moves through. And so the hypothesis is that flexible bodies and limbs generate locomotor robustness without need for major motor program changes. And Yasmin implemented this kind of mechanical intelligence into the limbs, which is sort of a passive bending of the limb when it strikes an object. And lo and behold, she decided then she would take it out into the real world and without any brain power, this is all what we call open loop, we're simply using the geometric mechanics to pick a gate which is good for movement on flat terrain or rough terrain. We're leveraging uh, the kind of uh, compliance of the limbs and some softness of the body which she put in. And so she's turned her robo-physical device, in my opinion, into an actual robot that can now start to go lots of places which I never thought uh, in my, out of my lab, we'd get anything that would be practically useful to go anywhere. So I just think this is kind of a nice wrap up to the story. Uh, and so let me close. Today's talk, uh, Robophysics, Physics Meets Robotics, using robots now, not as engineering devices, but as scientific instruments and tests of biological control hypotheses. There's not only fascinating physics, but there's important mechanics for robots. And the geometric mechanics framework for locomotion, coordination, control, and multi-component systems. One of the big surprises is that there's a diversity of macroscopic organisms that are dissipation dominated. So when I'm looking at a lizard swimming in sand or a centipede scuttling through rubble and leaf litter, it's kind of the moral equivalent of an organism in a highly viscous environment, a tiny organism uh, in fluids, which I think is kind of an interesting mind-altering idea for me leads to a general scheme to discover and optimize control templates, patterns of effective movement, and combined with appropriate passive elements can achieve robust locomotion and diverse terrain, creating robots from robo-physical models. You might ask, and then I'm gonna, I was gonna take another five minutes, but I'm not, I just wanna say, what else can we do with a robo-physics approach? And we're having a lot of fun discovering novel and surprising dynamics in active systems, and these folks have been helpful. I just wanna say that there's some interesting surprises. I can take a snake-like robot and let it collide with an array of posts. And after many repeated trials, basically the thing uh, without any thinking comes out at preferred orientations. And if I measure the width of this uh, pattern, probability to find the robot, it basically goes like one over the spacing between the, the posts. So essentially, I have a robot uncertainty principle such that if I try to localize the robot by squeezing down the distance between the posts, it scatters more and more strongly. And this, I think, is a nice refutation to our friend Heisenberg, who said, this matter and radiation possess a remarkable duality of character, sometimes exhibit properties of waves other than those of particles. Now, as obviously a thing cannot be a form of wave motion, it comes with particles at the same time. The two concepts are too different. Well, not if you're studying a robot. And I think I'll close there and uh, take any questions that folks might have. Let's unmute and uh, give an applause. This is fantastic. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can take some questions. I'd be delighted. And I'm sorry I went so fast and so long, but I didn't realize uh, what my time is. No was. problem. Sir, go ahead. Yeah, I had, I had actually, I had, I had lots of questions. <laughs> On the last point you made about this uh, this diffraction-like phenomenon, uh, there is one other classical uh, problem where you see this, which is these uh, droplets bouncing on uh, yes. Faraday wave surfaces. Yes, you do. 
Yeah. yeah. So that's that's just a side comment. Well, I mean, in fact, in fact, can I can I make a comment on yes, that side comment? Yes. The Coudere's work inspired me to do this. I had been I had wanted to do I the see. bouncing droplet problem. I'm not maniacal in thinking that's going to solve quantum mechanics, but I had been interested in that and wanted to do it with a robot and talked to John Bush and talked to Coudere and then said, shit, I wonder what would happen if this thing at here, you know, it's not like the bouncing droplet, which is basically the wave field in the environment is dominating a lot of this stuff. Here, the thing is both acting like, and we're finding actually this in lots of these active systems, provided they have cyclic self-deformation, which is pretty much what you get, uh, and they're localized, you could see crazy diffraction type phenomena, wave-like phenomena in these things, including Talbot carpets, uh, including, it just, it's a whole lot of fun. And in fact, just to plug this, we've actually put this stuff to good use. You can see this in real snakes too. This is a real snake moving through an array of posts. Here's a bunch of trajectories. And it turns out that the first order of these snakes are wavicles in Eddington's language. And knowing that actually has let us figure out what's going on in the so-called neuromechanical control scheme with these things. This is a paper from last year, which I just love because by looking at this diffraction pattern, it allowed us to constrain the kind of contribution of active and passive elements in the organism. So I like that as an as a, Okay, so sorry, that was your side point. Amazing. No, I, I'll save my other questions for later. Let other people ask questions. Okay. Okay, Dan, I have yeah. a question. Uh, like, do real animals learn to optimize their motion? It's a great question. Um, and what do you mean by learning, I guess, would be the Well, question. are they genetically programmed to do that automatically well, or do they learn? Well, I will say this, that the, the, that it's interesting. I don't, the, I don't know the answer to that other than I can say that, you know, let me show you a video. This guy, and by the way, this geometric scheme works quite well. Uh, hopefully this paper will come out in Nature Physics. We've been battling a reviewer on something works quite well to describe the amplitude the waves that the sidewinder uses and the reason i bring this up is that i know very well because we study these with zoo atlanta and one of our sidewinders had babies and the babies pop out and instantly pick the best wave to move wow so and not only that they have all the control apparatus one of the cool things about once you have these kind of low dimensional representations in the robots i didn't mention you could start to modulate parameters so I could start to change amplitudes and phases and my diversity of self-propulsion behaviors explodes. So these sidewinders doing a wonderful trick, even as babies, of basically if they want to turn, they can either flip their, there's two waves here. There's the horizontal wave and a vertical wave that are coupled. They can flip the phasing of that vertical wave and turn on a dime. If you challenge them with a sandy slope, which is one of the reasons people think sidewinding evolved to contend with sandy slopes because they're so brutal to challenge. They basically modulate their vertical wave to change the amount of body in contact to maintain the material below yielding or, or you know, not too much. Low. So now learning, you can also take these organisms. And here's another thing. You could take our fluidized beds, which I mentioned before, and you could make a, a snake, which moves over the surface of the sand in a nice waveform, very stereotype waveform. You can turn the fluidized bed to basically make it be in a fluid like state, that bubbling state and they go into a different swimming, which we don't understand, a different dynamics. So they, you know, we're, we're pretty confident that they can do these kind of template parameter adjustments on the fly. Once you have the good control target, then I think modulation of that, uh, and, and modulation both actively and with these passive elements like mechanical folding limbs kind of allows you to tweak and optimize. So that's an answer. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. One thought I had, uh, Dan, is that uh, for constructing a broader theoretical framework, uh, mm -hmm. theoretical slash computational framework for describing the dynamics, uh, in this case, you can use dynamic mode decomposition techniques, right? Wouldn't that be more general in terms of going 2D to 3D to, and so on and so forth? So again, I'm not a theoretician, so I would defer to my theoretical colleagues. You know, from our point of view, we basically use the simplest thing, principal component analysis to decompose the organisms into a few modes. And it turns out that works. I don't believe the organisms are two modes, but that works quite well 
to describe the kind of shapes we see. Now, DMD, you know, I'd let someone, and we've stuck in 2D because you can draw these nice, you know, they have these nice diagrams where you can just look at it and say, oh, that's, that's the thing we should do. But again, I, I think really some real theory is needed to, to be brought to bear on all these hmm. things. Uh, you know, it's, it's been the control theorists who basically pushed it, uh, but hadn't actually explicitly tested it on their robots. Uh, we performed the first test of this stuff as far as we could tell. Um, hmm. but, but the theoretical house should be, I think, built up. The other little thought I had is that, so, so right now, the, the way you've explained the dynamics also explains the U-turn, right? Because U-turn, instead of going this and that, can be this and this. That's what you meant by phase change? Yeah. Change? Ah, I, I haven't shown you the, uh, the, the sidewinder. Yeah, it turns out that the sidewinder, I don't have a video here. Um, the sidewinder actually does a, a, a funny thing where... I'll stop it. Actually, it would almost look like I'm playing it backwards. It goes like here, and then if it it actually looks like it's it turns and goes the opposite direction, and that actually mm -hmm. in, is a different paper. I can refer you to. Uh, basically, we can recapitulate that in the robot by swapping. There's a wave of horizontal body bending and a wave of vertical body bending, and if you flip the phase by pi of the vertical wave, that yeah. recapitulates the and they, they can turn by modulating the horizontal wave. There's all, we're playing all these kind of games now. It's fun because we get to think about frequency and amplitude modulation in waves on bodies. And, and so you can then, and you can make these robots surprisingly well controlled by do that. I should have had a slide on that. Yeah, also by, by varying the uh, segments, if you will, the, the, the length of the segments you can basically capture almost all kinds of dynamics that you, that an animal would want. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, and, and the nice thing is that, you know, that's why this robo physics is so much fun is that, you know, we couldn't do this 10 years ago before 3d printers, before all these motor right. controls. And now they're basically part of our laboratory toolkit for self propulsion. Mm -hmm. That's if I had to say anything, it would be that. Amazing. Sorry. I, 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 I hogged, uh, the, uh, please go ahead and ask a question. Yes. Subhu, please. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I've got a couple of quick questions. The first one was, um, so when one computes the height function, for instance, are yeah. we talking dissipative of dynamics or for that, are we talking like a Hamiltonian, you know, flow? This is because, not, these are not. Sorry, so because not, from what you showed, the friction seems to be playing an important role here. Huge, right? huge, huge. Right. The, the friction, now, uh, the, so, okay. So the cases I talked about and the case that we'll check worked out their scheme is friction or viscosity dominates everything, right? So right. there's no inertia. So it's all geometry, all shape changes. Okay. So, you know, whether you wiggle your body twice as fast, you get there twice as fast, but they don't change the displacement per cycle. That's an approximation, which is actually quite good in the granular material. Um, even, and we just had the paper on this, even when a snake is swimming on the surface of sand at a meter a second, a snake this long swimming at a meter a second, there's so much damping that the geometric scheme predicts nails the wave pattern that thing uses. So it's just hysterical that this, this works out. Uh, and it's something, like I said, you know, there's been debate in the literature. And, and in fact, this actually is an interesting point because some of you may remember that Phil Holmes uh, studied these interesting models of cockroach locomotion um, uh, about 20 years back. Um, and there, the implication was that the dynamics in a, he modeled it as a conservative system. A conservative system where you make and break point contact with the ground, no dissipation, but that leads to some interesting non holonomic right. dynamics, which give you asymptotic stability in certain variables. There, and they rationalize some of the cockroach behavior as basically playing this open loop pattern of dynamics, which, which, which generates the kind of oscillatory movement. Here we're finding that, you know, it may be that the, the, the vast majority of cases, organisms like cockroaches, lizards, most snakes that would have to go into Thai caves, snake robots, friction just is, is so important. For bipeds like us, Friction is not so important, right? I mean, you know, we coast or we trip. 
but I think the bulk of organisms living in this planet are in highly dom dissipation dominated environments. That's just my, that's my big belief. I don't know if that's true. Okay. Um, Sorry. Um, oh, so yeah, go ahead. No, no go please ahead. go ahead. I'll wait. Please go ahead. No, no. I mean, I, I didn't understand why you said for bipeds like us, friction is not that important. Walking is complete, completely friction. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Let me let me put it this way: friction on your feet, as otherwise otherwise you slip. But but dissipation in the environment, I can make. Okay. And as we know, friction doesn't have to, to doesn't have to unless you slide. Uh, from what I tell my intro physics class, friction doesn't dissipate. Right. Uh, I can. I can have, uh, I can make a bipedal walker, a robotic bipedal walker, which is essentially dissipationless with no energy injection. You might've seen some of these, Andrew Ruin at sure, Cornell. Sure. I, uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and so, so, so you need a static friction, right? But it doesn't mean you, you scrub away energy. And the interesting thing is that then that thing, if I, trip that walker, it's going to tumble down the hill, right? Whereas if I trip a cockroach or trip a sandfish, which sounds insane, but I once spent a month trying to do that for studying some perturbation dynamics, it's nearly impossible. And the reason it's nearly impossible is because energy is just sucked away so quickly when you have multiple contacts. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. If I may, just quickly, one more question. Could you comment on the potential role of stochasticity in all of this? Do you oh, think no uh, noise is important? Yes, yes, and I have many answers on that. Uh, and so what we're, what we're starting to realize, actually, and, and one of my students, actually, former student, a guy named Chen Li, who's now at Johns Hopkins, um, is doing really nice stuff on this, uh, is that the macroscopic world you know, we tend to think of the microscopic world and the life of a cell is very noisy. KT, of course, right? Everything is kind of taking place in this KT where KT is keeping things just on the edge. But I think when you're an organism moving in your environment, uh, and we see this in particularly in nasty desert environments where you have boulders and rocks, is that the fluctuations are huge and and they swamp uh, so much of, of the dynamics that, that uh, yeah, so I think that that, I haven't thought deeply about it and we haven't explored it, but uh, managing and mitigating those fluctuations is a very interesting story. And like I said, Chen Li has been working on cockroach locomotion in and other locomotion in kind of uh, grassy stochastic environments and is even developing an interesting kind of potential landscape picture analogous to that of protein folding. Uh, and he has a recent paper, I think it's a PNAS paper, uh, which you might find uh, find interesting in that regard. I think it's really cool. And, and he's looking for theoretical help, he tells me. Ah, I see. Um, and just <laughs> to add to that, just to add to that, or maybe, you know, not even going beyond mitigation, uh, even seeking to exploit the noise, you know, if you have okay. nonlinearity there. Oh, well, can I then uh, share my screen? Will you permit me to share my screen? Because there was one slide, if I had time, I was going to yes, get yes, to, yes. Uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, that, that, because what else are we doing with this stuff? You know, now we're going a little crazy. Uh, is that, can you share my screen? See my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, let me, let me minimize this. Yes. So this is kind of funny. Uh, so and I'll get to your question is that we've been also now trying to push, you know, ideas in modern physics into this robot stuff. So here is interaction via the environment. Here's either water walking insects or black holes. Why do I bring that up? Because we've now figured out how to make a robophysical analog gravity thing. So here's Yasmin as a postdoc steering a robot with nothing but the force. It's on a spandex membrane. It turns out that's not just cute. Uh, here's the robot orbiting a fixed central depression. It turns out that if you look at the orbits, and I'm getting to the stochasticity part, if you look at the orbits in these things, they are processing orbits. And it turns out that it, working with my chair of my department, former chair of my department, who's about to go to UT Austin, Pablo Laguna, who's a relativist, we can describe the robot plus the membrane as a test particle in a fiducial space-time 
and then basically start to actually, we now have a robo-physical analog gravity system. I just had to advertise this. This is in the vision. Uh, space-time telling matter how to curve, move matter till space-time on a curve. We can map this damn thing onto a GR-like framework. Uh, I'd be happy to send a preprint to anybody who's interested. Here's two robots interacting with each other via only the metric. Okay, so, but to your question, uh, here's where, and I'd put this in, here's, you know, active matter, we're interested in sort of task-oriented active matter when the active matter is doing something like digging tunnels by ants or robots. Uh, but your question about stochasticity is a very interesting one, and it gets to uh, the, the, the thing I, I said very early on, how well do parts have to work in order to get self-propulsion? Here's a paper we had uh, last year, came out in the journal Science Robotics, um, in which we're studying what we call smart active particles, which cannot self-propel on their own in a certain configuration. I can show you that by, here's a little robot. Can you see this playing? The little robot is a Purcell swimmer. It's sitting on a table. The arms don't touch the ground, so it doesn't swim anywhere, okay? It turns out, though, that if I put this thing into a, a ring and put a few more robots in there that are flapping around, it can actually stochastically diffuse. And if I make a rule that says the robot, if it sees a light, freezes, becomes straight and rigid, then the entire ensemble can collectively self-propel and transport without any robot being the leader and using stochasticity to actually uh, achieve a goal. And this is not unique. We're finding this in other systems like this is a model with a colleague of mine, Saad Bamla at Georgia Tech. We've been studying blobs of worms. Uh, and this is a robotic blob, uh, a blob of robots, which can collectively self-propel with no, with essentially no fixed leader, via only emergent rules. And finally, I just have to advertise this because I was going to end in this if I had time, that to honor Bob Berenger, who many of you, of course, know well, uh, we've been studying little disc-like robots, which... Uh, above a certain, they have magnets on their edges, above a certain magnetic force, or actually we can control their speed, uh, they can undergo a phase change where they can become a kind of uh, a solid or a, a kind of weak, weak solid type system and actually uh, stochastically transport impurities out of their arena. And we call these behaving, organizing, and buzzing robots because I wanted to honor Bob, because part of what we use in this is that they sense stresses at their environment and they act on those stresses to change their change their state. So that's in prep. Uh, but so that's a long-winded answer, an advertising answer for the role of stochasticity. But I am very interested in just how well coordinated all this geometric mechanics stuff I just showed is basically yeah, you're you're coordinating things uh, you know ahead of time. I'm increasingly interested in how you could do this stuff when there's no central coordination and control. And, and we're looking at pieces here and there. Um, that, that, that's a very long-winded and, and, and promoting answer. Any further uh, questions? While we have uh, Sam here. I have one small question. Yes, yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, in the active matter game, rather than having objects that execute uh, complex internal motions. You can also make things self-propel just by random energy input, and then they move in a direction dictated by the overall symmetry of the object, like if you have a, yes. a tapered particle. Right? So in your case, if, you, if instead of a, a one-way wave of uh, conformation along the filament, you mm -hmm. had a structured object which just kind of vibrated, but one end was fat and one end was skinny, would it yep. make much progress through sand, over sand? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, yeah, we, we've tried. A, we've tried that. Uh, hmm. Why? So I mean, you, you, again, you gave it random undulations. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Through said, okay, I can give you a couple answers on that. We've tried various. This was something I was actually teaching a course at Woods Hole two years mm -hmm. ago, and I was having some biologists make little robo physical <laughs> devices to, and we basically made little vi kind of bristle bots with mm -hmm. different limb configurations and different driving of their motor as a function of light and found some interesting nonlinearities such that just because you increase the motor vibration, the doesn't mean it goes faster because of the, they were poorly made. Sometimes it turns left, sometimes it turns right. So on hard ground, I think the kind of program you're, you're 
you're suggesting works great. When the materials are more complicated, you really have to go into a swimming mode. And I, I don't, and, and again, rectifying motion via randomness and mm -hmm. swimming, I, I, I haven't, yeah, I don't know. So I, I, don't. I know that Denis Bartolo and company did show maybe numerically that a shaken fluid with a, with a you know, a yeah. stoma with symmetry did execute motion. So that, that at least in it's, Stokes fluids, they were able to do that. The, the question, I guess, is how much motion, right? Is, is it? Sure, is yeah, it, I don't know. Could, yeah. Is it good for anything? And, but, but it's an interest. So you're, 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 you're saying, you're imagining, let's say I didn't want to make a sandfish swimmer, a wave that, a beautiful wave that propagates from head to tail that at, requires coordination. Suppose I wanted to make more like my super smarticle that is basically how effective is that? And yeah, I, I, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I mean, to counter my own argument, you can say that, you know, even in the molecular motor story, people suggested a simple Brownian ratchet thing, but ultimately real molecular motors have figured out better ways, you know, that they walk. might start out, start out, evolutionarily you'll find, find a better way, but uh, you know. Yeah, okay, here's there's, what I'll say. Yeah. Here's what I say, I just thought of an answer to that. So from the, sorry to interrupt that. Okay, so if I go to my, let's imagine these height functions are a good, way to think about, right? Enclosing surface integrals is a good way to think about it. The odds of doing after one cycle of enclosing amount of area is with a stochastic self-deformation pattern, I think is pretty small. I think that's probably one answer, right? right. It just, you, you can move, you know, <laughs> As long as you, as long as you break a symmetry in your, in, in your gate, you can move in these highly damped environments. It's just how much, you know, you could do sure. huge undulations, right? You could go back and forth, back and forth. But if after one cycle, you haven't enclosed any surface integral, then you've done a lot of, I guess that's one answer. Now, the other answer, right, is that, well, suppose you permanently change the environment when you're wiggling around. You rectify it. Aren't there some bacteria that do that, that basically leave kind of more solid like stuff behind them? I sort I of mean, recall there's, that. There's some which depolymerize act, uh, the cytoskeleton and move through. I mean, so there are ones which uh, leave a trail of depolymerized stuff which picks up and that's their motility making. That's, um, well, uh, Listeria or something like that. So right. This. That's cellular. I, yeah, I mean, cellular crawling. In fact, that's some of the motivation for our smarticle stuff is that I want to have a fluid at the front and a solid at the back. These worm blobs, which are in, in review right now, are really spectacular in that. It's kind of like a macroscopic cell. You have a bunch of a blob of 50,000 worms, and the front ones are kind of pulling, and the hind they want to come towards, you know, get away from heat sources. Uh, and the back ones are kind of lifting and the thing just self-organizes and translates, but it's slow. It's good because it protects them right. all, but it's slow. Uh, so I guess it's really a question of, you know, to what effect, right? And I tend to be focused on kind of, because of my living systems focus, I tend to be focused on the, the, the targets of control, the goals, the organism wants to flee me or go find some food or something. Cool, thanks. There, there seems to be, uh, I mean, I, I suppose you're, you're also saying that swimming from an evolutionary perspective is the more primitive uh, dynamics, is it? So in other words, uh, with evolution over billions of years, mm -hmm. uh, the original, uh, let's say, swimming uh, instincts, or, or, or sk instinct is not the right word that assumes a brain, but 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 the swimming skill set, whatever it is, uh, yeah. can evolve into more complex uh, yeah. locomotion. 
Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we we have a paper in which we studied the, uh, you know, one thing that's I've been interested in a lot of this stuff actually, as you can probably guess, has kind of an evolutionary bent in context. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the questions is, it turns out that there's lots of these desert snakes and lizards, and one curious feature of these desert lizards tends to be that they get long and skinny, and they lose limbs over evolutionary time. Why does that happen? Uh, and but they still use waves. But the waves, and I have a student working on this right now, the same brilliant student, Bashi Chung, who's been pushing all the geometric mechanics and the centipedes, working with a biologist who's a real expert on what's called functional morphology, is you have this whole class of lizards, which some have short front limbs, longer hind limbs, some have no toes, some are long and skinny, some are short and squat. What kind of waves do they use to move through their environments? And they, it, it, it could be traveling waves, it could be sort of semi-standing waves, but it turns out this geometric mechanics, if you input the body shapes, gives you a pretty good answer on why, what kind of wave and how it should be coordinated with limbs. So that's the other aspect to this. So, you know, I think that this general pattern, and it sounds obvious once you say it, that, you know, traveling waves from head to tail are a control goal. Uh, but when that first started, you know, the first organism to use a wave, because it's not, you know, we don't do it. When, when we swim, I can't do a butterfly. I can do barely a crawl. Uh, but, you know, it, it's an interesting thing to, to, it sounds almost trivial, but I don't think it is that this pattern shows up over and over and over. And again, it could be convergent, you know, many organisms. Uh, yeah, I mean, we are, of course, very complex, and we have been evolving for more than 2 billion years, whereas uh, if you look at very primitive things, then, uh, yeah. Well, even then, primitive, you know, okay, so here's a funny, here, here's a funny coda to this, that, so we've been studying the sandfish, and that guy told you, well, it kind of looks like a C. elegans, right, and okay, was that a cute analogy, what, what, well, I had a colleague who said, you know, you've been studying all these snakes, but who cares about snakes? Why don't you study an organism that people spend a lot of money on, which is nematode worms. So I've been working now with a colleague of mine at Georgia Tech, Kong Lu, who's a, a worm person. And in the U.S., <laughs> worm people get lots of NIH money. Uh, and lo and behold, if these simple, you know, I love when people say, well, the nematode worm is simple because it only has 302 neurons. But for those of us from a dynamical systems point of view, which by the way, I think is underrepresented in the view of biology and physics interaction. It tends to be, you know, kind of soft matter and uh, stab but the nonlinear dynamics point of view says, okay, 300, boy, three. That's nuts. Uh, yeah, that, that it's a simple organism. So then you start to see, well, how simple is C. elegans? And so we've begun this parallel program to what we've done with snakes and nematodes. And the first thing you say is, well, what, organ what environments they live in? And the answer is that most people study them on agar plates, which of course not their natural environment. Their natural environments are like rotten peaches or on the back of, of snails. And so then you say, well, what's the rheology of that? And so you start to put them in more natural situations and we're finding hysterically interesting behaviors. And not only that, the, this surprised my robot collaborator. How do you make a robot, a lidless robot turn in place the best? Well, these guys have been spending years making their, we studied the nematode. They have something called the omega turn, which everybody knows about in that world. And it turns out that if you analyze the omega turn from a geometric mechanics point of view, it's a pretty good turn. It may not be the best turn, but it's robust over a diversity of environments. So whether you're in viscous material, whether you're in kind of more frictional stuff, whether you're in tight quarters and don't want to bang into things, that omega turn is a lovely way to turn. Put that on the robot and man, it can turn in place now. Uh, and so, and that's, and the robot, by the way, is very simple too. It has only 16 degrees of freedom, right? But we have yeah. precious little clue. So the nematode is just, even a primitive organ, quote unquote primitive, is more sophisticated than anything that humans have ever built, I would argue. And because a lot of it is not just the neural wiring and the connectome, but you got a body which is squishy and soft and it's made of, you know, these things are just, it's a lovely antidote to kind of arrogance of thinking that, well, something is simple because it has few degrees of freedom. So we're pushing hard on that. It's, 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 it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, yeah. This, this is, this is super cool. Well, any other questions before we close?
before my daughter comes in here again and starts to yell at me. Yes, we, we, I'm sure she, she needs you desperately now. <laughs> well, <laughs> my, my wife's in the other room, so we're, we're okay for now. But thank you all so all much right. for having me. Thank you so much and uh, have a great weekend. And really, uh, very grateful that you took the time to make the Saturday morning so exciting for us all. Well, thank you all. Been a pleasure. Uh, bye. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to see you all.